day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So glad that you're able to join us on Speak the Word. I pray that all is well and God has continued blessing you. As we come together to study the Word, we pray that we may learn practical application, that we may go forth and be what God wants us to be. If you are blessed by this channel, please take the time to subscribe and hit the like button. You can find me on YouTube, also on Facebook. The following, the information will be given right after this clip, but I pray that you will take the time not only to walk with me as we go to, through the word, but also invite others that we may grow as a community. Because in times like this, we as the saints of God need to stand strong and be firm in the Lord that we may go forth and be what God wants us to be. As we go forward, remember to speak the word. Next, we will have our summary, getting ready for our next election, and then we will hear the word as we go forth and lifting up the name of Jesus. See you in a moment. Hello, glad that you are with us, and I pray that all is well. Today we're going to flip the script, we're going to change things up, we're going to do things a little bit different. I will have a special guest, a very special guest, which happened to be my son, Reverend Brandon Slaughter, or you can call him Reverend B. He will be bringing the word and a message that is pre-recorded that was done in First Baptist of Vienna. Let's pray with him as he lift up the name of Jesus and as he impart the word as it go forth, doing what God has called him to do. Stay tuned and pray as God bless you with this word from on high. Glory, Pastor Walton, for once again allowing me to share my convictions. But I don't want to prolong your time, so with me to a familiar passage of scripture. Uh, journey with me to Psalm 23 that is the 23rd division of Saul and it reads the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he maketh me to lie down in green pastures he leadeth me beside still waters he restoreth my soul he leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thine rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
If you'd like to hang out with me for this homiletical moment, I'll be coming from the subject of, I'm about to lose my mind. Shall we pray together? Dear Heavenly Father, O Holy One, thank you, God, for the opportunity to gather, to engage, and to, to come to this moment. God, we don't know what we have dealt with this week, but God, we know that there is a word from you. So God, I ask that you strengthen me in this moment, that you hold me in this moment, and that we will be made better because of this moment. We ask these things in your son, Christ Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen. It is no mystery that 2020 has been a difficult year. From beloved celebrity deaths to racial tensions to the pandemics to high levels of unemployment, we all have seen our sense of normalcy turned upside down. It's just as the hymnologist says that time is filled with swift transitions. Not on earth a move can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal and hold to God's unchanging hand. But I would rather take that further and suggest that we are living in times like Walter Hawkins once said that tragedies are commonplace. All type of diseases, people are slipping away. The economy's down and people can't get enough pay, but bef but 2020 differs from the songs, but because before I can thank the Lord, I am met with more problems. Folks without homes, people all in the streets and drug habits, some say they just can't beat muggers and robbers. No place seemed to be safe. And it is at this crossroads where I stand this morning, somewhere between God, what's going on, and God, where are you? The crossroads between God, this hurts, and God, are you there? The crossroads between if one more thing happens, I don't know what I'm going to do. And if some of us could tell the truth in the chat on this morning, many, many of us are too helpless to be hopeful. We can admit that life has hit us with so many punches this year that we have thrown in the white flag and said, God, this is it. And, and God, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm tired of fighting. And maybe you are fighting from acceptance from people who cannot see th that you have moved past your previous places. Maybe you're tired of fighting with your spouse to see the hurt in places and love you to move past it. Maybe you're tired of fighting against illness. And when God turns a deaf ear to those cries for hills, maybe you're tired of fighting for financial breakthrough. And it seems like everybody is getting stimulus checks from God and he ain't moving like he sh should. Come here Fannie Lou Hamer or maybe you're just tired of being sick and tired because in 2020 we have all uttered these next six words and it is I'm about to lose my mind. But I came to suggest this morning that we have to move from losing our mind to losing our mind. I can hear someone in the chat saying, Minister B, you sound like you've already lost your mind. But many of us have allowed our perceived realities to drive us to self-damnation, not self-cultivation. What does that mean? I'm glad you asked that we have allowed many of our issues and stressors to, to provide so much hell in our minds that we have created prisons for our free bodies. Can I ask that when is the last time you got a full night's sleep? When is the last time you had a genuine smile on your face? When was the last time you felt loved and appreciated? Because I would like to suggest that a lot of, a, a lot of us put on a mask before COVID 19 and found out that life was hard breathing. 
Far too many of us sit with smiles on our faces, however, with tears on our heart. But I came to help someone declare on this morning that this is the last day that I spend in the prison that I created for myself. I just preach to myself that I'm getting out of this depression. I'm getting out of this self-damnation. I'm getting out of this feeling like I'm not good enough. I'm getting out of this feeling like I'm a victim. And whatever you're about to get out of, put it in the chat. But the only way to get out is to lose your mind. As we turn our attention to the text this morning, we find ourselves in one of the most familiar passages in the Old Testament. Psalms 23 is a scripture that mostly every Christian can recite from memory, but I would suggest that many of us have critical, have not critically digested this division of psalm. David begins this psalm with the assertion that the Lord is his shepherd. I have to pause there because this gives us an interesting claim. David, by the point of this writing, would have been a king, and he calls God his shepherd. In Israel, as in other ancient societies, a shepherd's work was considered the lowest of all works. If a family needed a shepherd, it was the youngest child like David. We got an unpleasant and and, an undesired assignment. Being a shepherd seemed like a lowly task to most people. And then I met with the question, how could a king see being a shepherd as a good thing. The only way a king could see being a shepherd as a blessing is if the king was once a shepherd. The first thing you must do if you're going to lose your mind is to conceptualize God in your context. David's assertion that God is a shepherd comes from the understanding of David's life as a shepherd. The issue is many of us have made our context of God outside of our own personal context. Our present day problems are sometimes bigger than our church cliches and bigger than our shallow scriptures quotes that lack understanding. And the reality is that God being your mother savior and a will in the middle of the will cannot help you understand God because it's out of your context. Can I make it plain? Our conception of God grows with our journey with God. Far too many of us are calling God what we have heard because we haven't took time to figure out who God is. But what David says is the Lord is my shepherd. Notice that after he says the Lord is my shepherd, he concludes what the Lord does. That is a concept. And when you conceptualize something, there is a response on both parties. Simply put that because something is bigger, something is, something else can happen. And a lot of times we never move from praise to conceptualizing God because conceptualizing happens before action. And conceptualizing says that I don't need the product or I don't have to see what, what's going to happen to understand what is actually going to happen. David says that because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. For David, the fact of God's shepherd likeness care was enough to end the dissatisfaction of need. He says, I shall not want both as a declaration and as a decision because he was not trying to understand God through his mama's lens or his daddy's lens. He was not trying to articulate the matters of the universe based on his scholarship, but the conceptualizing that he had of God was personal in nature. Here is the principle that personal declaration leads to personal freedom. Let me break this down. I remember when I was 16, I was trying to learn how to swim because, you know, at five, we had some situations and I was like, you know, I'm not going to learn how to swim because I was scared. So I was 16. I would say I was going to learn how to swim. By this point, I was I knew I was athletic. I had played football and 
People had told me all my life that I'm athletic. There is nothing in af in, in sports that you are going to struggle with because you are athletic. So the first day of swim class, I jump in the pool. I look around and I see people that I know don't have the same athletic ability that I have. So I'm in the front of the line. I'm going to do every drill first. I am going to be the first person. I'm going to swim the fastest out the class. I had made up in my mind. I was going to the Olympics and everything. And I get to swim class. And he calls us out for the first drill. And and there's a kid in my swim class that I knew I had raced previous years. I knew I was faster than this kid. So we both go out. He does the drill. He floats. He goes. I do the drill. Same thing that he does. I sink. I say, you know what? I'm just going to shrug it off. My prize hurt a little bit. I keep, going throughout the, I keep going throughout the day. And every single drill that we did in that swim class, I finished last. So I went to the teacher upset. I was like, now look, I know I'm athletic. And I know other people in this class aren't as athletic as me. So obviously you're teaching me the wrong form. Obviously there's something wrong with the way that you're teaching me. And the swim teacher looked at me and smiled and laughed. He said, Brandon, it's because of your muscular frame that you have a, you're going to have a harder time in the water. So just the way that I'm teaching them to swim has to be different because of your body type. And too many of us are allowing our conceptualization of God to be like people who aren't built the same as us. Too many of us are trying to pray like so-and-so, preach like so-and-so, dress like so-and-so, and drive a car like that person and this person, but you still have to know God for yourself. You have to have your own development of who God is. Not only do you have to conceptualize God in your context, but you have to reposition your perspective. David goes on to articulate, yes, though I walk through the valleys of the shadow of death. This is the first note of this beautiful psalm that feels dark. Previously, David wrote of green pastures and still waters and paths of righteousness. Yet when following the Lord as his shepherd, one may still walk through valleys of shadow of death. So you see, it is in the valley, not the mountaintop or the broad mellows. It is a valley suggesting being hedged and surrounded. It is the valley of shadow of death, not facing the substance of death itself, but the shadow casting its dark field for outline across David's path. It is a valley of the shadow of death facing what seems to David like ultimate defeat and evil. We all have seen what seems like shadows of death in our own life. But David's remedy for the shadow is what blows my mind. Watch this. David says, I will fear no evil. This is interesting because despite even dark association with the idea of the valley of the shadow of death, David residently says that because he knew the care of his shepherd, even in a fearful place, the presence of the shepherd banished the fear of evil. This, this emphasis that it is the presence of the shepherd that eliminated the fear of evil for the sheep. No matter the presence of the environment, David could look to the fact that God's shepherd-like presence that is seen in you are with me and I will not fear. I would like to suggest that because of David's attention was not on the shadows, but the attention was on God because David understood that shadows don't kill. I just said right there that there are a lot of situations in our lives that look like death, but it's only a shadow. Those people at your job talking about you like a dog, they are, and it seems like they are winning. You have to remember that it is only a shadow. Those friends who seem like they, they can't see your growth and advancement. It just, you got to remember that it is only a shadow. When your 
bills are due and your money is funny, your change is strange, your nickels are fickles, your quarters are in order, that it is only a shadow because here is the key that's going to send the chat into praise that you can't see shadows when it's completely dark. And the fact that there is a shadow means that there must be light somewhere. And if you know you got some light, just type, I got light left. I got light left. I know I'm broke, but I still got life left. I know what I know. I seem sick, but I still got some light left. And the fact that I can see a shadow lets me know that I got light. Here's the principle that shadows aren't indicators of death. Shadows are indicators that there is still light left. But, but it's a matter of perception. This is why we have to redirect our perspective. Houdini, I have a story that, that Harry Houdini made a name for himself by escaping from every imaginable confinement, from straight jackets to multiple pairs of handcuffs clamped to his arm. He boasted that he could escape from anything. So one time he boasted that he could escape from a jail cell and time and time again he would be locked in a cell only to miraculously reappear somewhere else. It worked every time except one. He accepted this invitation in a jail in Alabama to demonstrate his skill. He entered a cell wearing his street clothes and the jail door was shut. Once alone he pulled out a thin piece of metal from his belt and began to work on the lock but something was wrong no matter how Harry Houdini worked he couldn't unlock the the, the the lock for two hours he applied his skills and experience to the lock but failed time and time again two hours later he gave up in frustration you're probably wondering that if he unlocked all them jail cells before, why could he unlock this one jail cell in Alabama? Here's the problem. The problem is that the cell had never been locked. Harry Houdini worked himself to near exhaustion to achieve what had been accomplished by simply pushing the door. And the only place that the door was locked was in his mind. And I came to suggest that it is truly like the songwriter says, if you free your mind, the rest will follow. And many of us will say that how careless by Harry Houdini, but many of us stay up at night losing sleep over things that God has been walking us through because we are focused on the shadows and then we're trying to unlock, unlock doors. But God sent me on this Sunday to tell somebody that they need to stop looking at the shadows and look at the light. But the only way that you can do that is you have to reposition your perspective. David goes on to write that you prepare a table before me Without departing from the previous picture of the the valley of the shadow of death, David envisions his provisions and goodness by the Lord as a host. Inviting David to a rich table and prepare for him. Now the next phrase is where we have our theological tension with because of in the presence of my enemies. This is a striking phrase that the goodness and care suggested by the table is set in the middle of the presence of the enemy. David says that the host's care and concern does not eliminate the presence of the enemy, but enables the experience of God's goodness and the bounty even in their midst. Now, we love the imagery of this the, of this part that we, we this is where we run in church this is where we shout this is where we jump but now I had to think logically I had to think logically and I just thought that when a soldier is in the presence of his enemy he eats at all he snatches like it snatches the, the hasty meal and and when when the dark cloths unfold and and when the and when the soldier really looks at the meal, he eats the meal with haste. But, but what, what David, imagery David gives us in this chapter is that nothing is rushed. There is no confusion. There is no disturbance. And the enemy is at the door. And yet God prepares a table. 
And the Christian has to sit down and eat everything in perfect peace. Now, the facts say that the person should not should be eating at the table on guard. The blessing does not change because of the audience or who likes the person at the table. But the blessing is between the receiver and the blesser. I just said something that too many times we get so caught up on what people are saying at our table that we change the way that we enjoy what God has given us in our lives. We become too worried about where God blesses us that we miss the anointing. The whole time I I read this chapter, I thought that the blessing was all that was needed. But the only way that we're going to make it through 2020 is that we not only get the blessing, but is that we get the anointing. And the fact, the fatal flaw of Christians is that we take the blessing with haste and miss the anointment. Despite the dangers about the presence of the enemies, David enjoys the richness of God's goodness. He was refreshed with his head with oil and his cup was overfilled. David takes ownership of his blessing by God, which culminates in him being anointed by God. Here is the principle that you cannot allow hostile blessing grounds to ruin your table experience because the power of God is what the the power is what God is trying to do in your life. And it's not just the blessing, but it is an anointing. And the reason why you should tear up your house on this morning is because if God would have stopped at the table, he would have done everything you asked. If God would have stopped at paying your bills, you would have been fine. If God would have stopped at helping you graduate, you would have been grateful. If God would have stopped at at giving you one promotion, you would have shouted. If God would have stopped at putting your marriage back together, you would have gave them the glory. If God would have stopped at your kids being safe, you would have gave them a praise. But God gave you an anointing. And what is that anointing? It is that goodness and mercy will follow you all the days. So even in a pandemic, I got goodness and mercy. Racial tensions may be happening, but I got goodness and mercy. Don't know if I'm have a future at my job, but I got goodness and mercy. Don't know how I'm going to manage work and that eating my kids, but I got goodness and mercy. May be sick right now, but I got goodness and mercy. They may be lying on me but I got goodness and mercy they may be talking about me but I got goodness and mercy talk about me all you want but I got goodness and mercy and I love what the songwriter says because because of goodness and mercy you offer God your praise and every time I think about goodness and mercy I gotta give God a praise So you was probably wondering from the title, how do you lose your mind? That's when you praise God, like goodness and mercies beside you. They can lie on you, but praise God because goodness and mercy beside you. Cheat me, but goodness and mercy beside me. So what you gonna do? I'm gonna go to sleep. I know it look like I lost my mind. I'm gonna just put a smile on. I know like it lost my mind because I've lost all the things that were keeping me up because I got goodness and mercy and how long would they follow you? All the days when I'm broke, all the days when I'm sick, all the days. So can you do me one favor? Put your arms around yourself shake yourself and rock yourself and say goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days all the days all the days all the days if you believe it say yeah yeah yeah
Lame. 